So, Alien Romulus. Um, I really, really enjoy this. Um, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there were many things that, at the time, watching it for the first time, made me think, oh, what the, what the fuck? Um, few, few moments like that. I left the cinema for the first time, knowing that I'd enjoyed it, but a lot of questions, like, asking myself why did they do that why did they you know how did they make that decision what was the what was the mean what was the reason for that um so the movie starts in the debris field of the nostromo and they recover uh, what is essentially like a cocoon or on the soundtrack uh, the, the, the the music for this scene is called chrysalis so it's a chrysalis so the original alien is cocooned it's cocooned itself and it's still alive and from from that moment i'm thinking oh right okay so it's not a standalone movie this is in every sense this is a direct sequel to the first movie we see our main character rain um, she wakes up on a mining colony a uh, very, very dark, moody, um, very Blade Runner-esque, very grim, very sort of dystopian future vibes. Uh, really nice, nicely done. We meet Andy, her android friend. And then we meet her friends in the colony. Um, and they tell her that there is a decommissioned spaceship just above their heads floating in space and that it's got cryo tubes on it they, it's got sleep pods that they can use to escape to a colony that is not under Wayland yutani uh, jurisdiction they would be free they are essentially uh, slaves basically this it's, it's like indentured servitude they are contracted to this mining um, facility and they cannot leave it's it's got a, it's, it's almost like a penal colony which is uh, Reminds me of Alien 3 a little bit. So that's it. They take off. And they, and as they approach the spaceship, they realise it's not a spaceship. It's a space station. And it kind of looks a little bit like Sebastopol Station from Alien Isolation. They arrive. It's about to crash into an ice belt of the planet It's in about 47 hours. So they have to get on quick. They enter the space station. It's called the Renaissance Station, I think two halves, Romulus and Remus. Tyler, Bjorn and Andy uh, go on board. There is a gravity purge. So all of a sudden they're floating and then they fall, then they're floating and then they fall. And straight away you think that that's foreshadowing, that's gonna come into play later. And it does to like an insane effect, uh, but I did like it. Anyway, they reach the cave of sleep pods they haven't got enough fuel for them, so they go to a, they locate a cryo chamber at the other side of the station. So they go there, and then we discover a lot of little face huggers in these man-made uh, pods. Uh, they're not in eggs; they're in these sort of man-made sacks, basically, and they are starting to defrost. Put it into Andy, and he reboots. And. As they're escaping, all the facehuggers escape as well, and Navarro is facehugged. They manage to get the um, facehugger off Navarro. Um, she wakes up, and Andy now has has changed. His, his personality has become a little bit more like a normal android, because up until then he's, he seems quite quirky, but also quite, quite deficient. You get the impression that he's almost like a broken android. Uh, that should have probably been decommissioned. Uh, that's why he's got some idiosyncrasies that make him a bit more human. He's almost quite childlike, but when he's got this new module in his neck, he's not. He's almost. He, you start to get echoes of Ash, or David, or Walter, Bjorn, Navarro, and Kay manage to escape to the Corblian. Andy tries to stop them because he's got the. Uh, the other module in his neck so he's now kind of a bad guy or you, you kind of you're left to wonder whose side is he on 
Navarro, Kay and Bjorn reach the ship. And as they're trying to escape, the alien bursts from Navarro's chest. And then it crashes. The Corbulian crashes into a Logan Bay in the, the space station. Rain, Tyler and Andy then have to find another way to get to the crash site. And they have to go through this corridor where there's lots of face huggers. Andy explains that if they raise the temperature in the room, the body temperature, then the face huggers will be essentially blind, which is a, a, a nice little uh, touch. That's something new. Rain, Tyler and Andy escape uh, the face huggers. Meanwhile, Kay and Bjorn find some kind of cocoon. This is something we haven't seen before. This is the baby alien metamorphosizing into an adult alien. It's in this cocoon. Very H.R. Geiger-esque. You know, they've, uh, they've, they've really thought about staying true to Geiger's work while designing something new, something we haven't seen before. This, uh, this part of the creature's life cycle, which I thought was fantastic. Bjorn tries to kill it with a cattle prod, and he is then killed by the alien's tail. I think it's a tail. It's the it's some kind of spiked implement that um, pokes his eye out and then drenches him with acid, and his chest blows up, which it was great because he's a horrible character, and he's not a particularly good actor either. I thought the, I thought his performance was the, one of the weakest parts of the movie. Uh, anyway, so he's dead, uh, and while Kay is trying to escape. The others who are trapped with the face huggers, the face huggers discover them, and then there's a chase, and then they escape, and then they find Kay. She is on the other side of the door, hiding from the alien, and then the alien creeps up behind her and snatches her. We don't know whether she's alive or dead. There's a blood splatter on the window, and he didn't open the door because that it would have killed them all. So makes perfect sense. So they then go back to Rook, the android. Uh, that is the same make and model as Ash from the first movie. He explains about the black goo. So that's that's back. Uh, he explains that the alien from the Nostromo uh, wreaked havoc on the station, and as it was killed, it burnt a hole in the hull and uh, destroyed the station basically. And he explains about the black goo being uh, as X one compound or Z1 compound I'm not too sure but it basically it references the, the, the black goo from Prometheus and Covenant Rook wants them to take it back to the colony so the company can do further research after that they discover a hive they rescue Kay Tyler is then killed they make it to the Corblian ship but Rain goes back for Andy who was uh, injured uh, in the attack that killed Tyler. We then see Kay inject the black goo as Rook is on the video screen, uh, assuring her that it's for the best. She does that, end scene, and then Rain rescues Andy. They are then trapped, and as they are telling each other some bad jokes, they tell one about zero gravity, so Rain gets the idea to... Uh, turn off the gravity drive or reinitialize re the gravity purges or something like that. Anyway, the, the gravity turns off and the aliens all start floating and she shoots them all with the, the really nice uh, pulse rifle and then there are just spiralling blobs of acid blood that they have to traverse. That was a really uh, good scene. Very, very different. Then they managed to escape up an elevator shaft they get to the Corbulian ship, they detach from the station as it crashes into the ice field, and then as they get into the sleep pods, there is a warning sign on Kay's pod. Her, um, her life signs are critical, and she is giving birth. She is giving birth to some kind of weird alien egg. Rain tries to take it away from her. Acid starts to burn through the, the cloth, and it opens up and it's basically a human hybrid alien. It's very, very creepy. Um, there's acid everywhere, and it, 
it falls through the, the floor and you see this huge creepy horrific creature this human alien hybrid and it, it looks very reminiscent of the engineers from Prometheus it kills K slashes Andy's throat he's incapacitated rain suits up very reminiscent of uh, of Ripley from the first alien movie lures it towards her spills the acid from the the egg pod onto into the cargo deck it burns a hole in the hull and they are both sucked out into space and she then detaches the cargo hold from the main ship and the alien hybrid and the cargo hold crash into the ice field in the background you still see the station in in ruins behind behind them in the distance we see that um, still sort of in flames crashing onto the ice field is it over that's the question the fact that it's in the background would suggest that maybe maybe i don't know so that's the story i think uh, the mining colony reminds me of alien 3 with the company picking up the chrysalis the suits they had on reminds me of the um the company men from alien 3 at the end as well uh, even the music reminded me of the opening of alien 3 that um Elliot Goldenthal? Yeah, Elliot Goldenthal, his, his score. A lot of the music was um, reminded me of the first three movies, which was great. I love those soundtracks, uh, particularly the, the third movie. The interior of the space station, uh, I, again, it just looked like Sebastopol Station from Alien Isolation. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. The attention to detail with the set design was just incredible. It really was. You've had the pulse rifles. Uh, they had a twist on them. I'm glad he didn't use a flamethrower because that would have been a really easy one to throw in. Yeah, design wise, I just thought it was fantastic. These big sweeping shots. I mean, it, it, and it worked really well on IMAX. Wow. If there was any movie you need to see on IMAX, it's this one. It really did benefit it. Um, the spaceships as well, all the crafts, a lot of that was from behind the scenes uh, footage. A lot of that is practical effects. They are model kits, they are miniatures. And the aliens, again, uh, Fede Alvarez has prided himself on not using CGI aliens. I guess he used up all the CGI budget on the robot, but never mind. It was just very much, look what, you know, in terms of design, it was very, very much back to basics very very authentic and just beautiful i can't wait to find the art book when it comes out i i assume they will be bringing one out the art of alien romulus now i really enjoyed the movie i thought it was really good um but i can see why a lot of people are not happy it's quite hyperbolic uh, people are saying that it's amazing and people are saying it's terrible. I haven't really, I haven't spoken to anybody yet who is sort of lukewarm on it. Everyone has, so far that I've spoken to has got quite extreme views, you know, either end of the spectrum. So I suppose what we've got to talk about is probably the uh, callbacks and the references and the uh, dialogue from previous movies, the ending as well. Uh, well, there's, and there's a, also a, a subplot that probably needs to be addressed as well could have been left out and it would have been a stronger film in my opinion but let's let's start with um, let's just start with the references let's go through them one by one now the design of the film and all the sets i thought that was fantastic because i think you need that if you want to tie it into this world then it makes sense to have the vehicles uh, the interiors uh, the costumes the, the tech that they're using um, it, that has to look like it's taken directly from the first movie because this is this is set 20 years after the first movie there were some parts that went a bit too far like he pulls out a motion tracker which is very similar to the one from alien and he's using that to get to the cryo chamber now i don't 
I don't know why you'd use that um, to find um, cryo fuel. That felt like it was just stuck in there because it's it's in the first movie. It's in the video game. Let's put it in the film. That's the lower end of the spectrum. The nodding bird that's in that's on the, the table in the first movie. Again, we see that. I think we see it in Prometheus. Or maybe Covenant, I'm not sure. I don't know why it's there. It was just, a, it's a tiny little prop from the first film, but it seems to, it pops up everywhere. Again, these are little, they, they are little, they're like Easter eggs. They're just these little references. But then it gets more extreme. This film is very much doing its own thing until the halfway point. And I think at the halfway point, that's where we are introduced to the android Rook who is, it's essentially a, a deep fake Ian Home. It's the Ash robot from the first movie, but it's it's the, it's a different robot. It's the same make and model. He's even wearing the same clothes for some reason, even though it's 20 years later. I, you know, that's, but again, that's just a, that's a design choice. Again, that's, that's, something like that is a nod rather than a huge callback. That was a little bit too far. I think that it, it would have worked better if we'd have just seen a damaged android, you know, damaged beyond recognition, face half melted off or, you know, head missing and they just, you know, they, they, they could plug him into a terminal and then Andy could speak to him or just take his module out and put it in Andy and then Andy can, can have all the exposition. We don't need this rook android to unveil his, you know, evil plan, you know, like his gold finger. And at that point, that's when I kind of thought, oh God, that was the point in the movie that kind of shifted and then it, it, it then turned into almost like a fan film. I don't know, I think it was too, for my for my taste anyway, it was, I think it was too far and it was a little bit unnecessary. You needed that exposition, but if you're going to do a scene like that, you've got to light it differently. You know, if you're going to use CGI to bring a character back to life, um. You can't have it front and centre on on camera, perfectly lit. You've, you've got to shoot that in shadow, surely. If you're not going to create damage to the actual face, I mean, it's you've, you've got to light that differently. It's got to be side lit or something like, you know, do something. But you've, it just, especially on the big screen, especially in the cinema, and I've watched this, I've watched this three times now, once in the cinema, once on the internet and then I went back to the cinema a second time to watch it on IMAX and on a big screen oh it's even more obvious that it's, it, it's just a deep fake now Fede Alvarez has specifically said it's an animatronic it I'm sure it was an animatronic but that face has definitely been tampered with it looked like it, they'd used a face swap app with Ian Home, a young Ian Holm and for me, it just, it was so, so distracting. It was really, really jarring. And then the black goo from Prometheus, it turns out they've reverse engineered the big chap from Alien and they've harnessed the the, the pathogen, even refers to it as a, as a pathogen and calls it the Prometheus fire. And then there's this little music, this little musical beat and it's the the theme tune from Prometheus, much like Covenant did. Again, it's it's a little it's pushed a little bit too far. It ceases to become a nod, and then it just turns into a, that just a, a callback. And I think that's that's gone a little bit too far. I mean, they're perfectly in, within their right to try to tie this into Prometheus. It makes sense. It's all the same saga. And then we get the hybrid. Now, obviously, it reminds me of. Resurrection. As soon as Kay injects the black goo, I thought she's either going to turn into an alien, or she's going to give birth to an alien. That's that's like something we haven't seen before. When she does, and it ends up looking like an engineer, then it made sense. A bit freaky. It made sense in the story to have Kay give birth to a hybrid. We've seen an alien human hybrid. Now we've seen a human alien hybrid. In resurrection, obviously, it was a, it was a human. Born from an alien, and in this movie, it's an alien born from a human. Um, which which was fine. I thought it was really really creepy. Um, very, <laughs> I got a, a bit of a fright. 
it was the way it was shot it was great because it, the, the the music stops they turn around and then it's just this thing just there just oh, it's, it's, <laughs> i thought it was really really horrible and then we see rain obviously she suits up again just like ripley did main character in covenant i can't even remember her name you know all the all the final girls all end up suiting up because you've got to remind people the you know alien you know gotta get them box sets gotta get disney plus gotta watch all the other movies and again the alien is blown out of a, a hole in the side of a ship a little bit more uh, restrained than the alien resurrection version of events although um, i mean resurrection it is what it is so a lot of people are angry about that um, you know, uh, people are saying, "Oh, there's a, so there's another another different type of alien," and and I think, well, every alien movie has had a hybrid or a variant of of a xenomorph. The original movie just had the one in Aliens. We see the alien queen. Alien Three again, it's a dog alien or a bull alien, depending on which movie you watch. But let's just say, for argument's sake, it's a dog alien. It's got dog traits because it's been born from a dog. We also see a royal face hugger in that movie as well. Its legs are webbed and it impregnates more than one uh, host. Alien Resurrection, again, the aliens are bog standard, but we see the hybrid at the end of the movie. Uh, AVP Requiem has the Prez alien. Prometheus has the Deacon alien. And Covenant has the Neomorph. Uh, so it's only really the original alien and predator movie that has just bog standard xenomorphs in so you know they've all had they've all played with the with the alien law what we have to sort of ask ourselves is you know how 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 much is too much how far can you go with references the design was was needed to tie it into that world um the the parallels in story Again, that's not a big thing. That's uh, that's very commonplace with sequels. Uh, they do tend to um, repeat themselves a little bit. I think for me, the dialogue um, was the was the biggest cause for concern and had me thinking, what, why did you do that? Why was that in the movie? Why is that written like that? I just think it's it's just a bit too far because it's essentially just like an in joke. And he says, I prefer the term artificial person myself. Obviously, Bishop's line from Aliens. The android Rook says, the perfect organism, that's fine. That, I'd say that's just a nod. But then he says, I'm not going to lie to you about your chances, but you have my sympathies. Or something like that. It's literally word for word from the Alien uh, movie. They get to the hive and someone says, busy little creatures. Again, that's Burke's line. The worst one for me, personally, is when Andy is flying down the elevator shaft like a ninja shooting with the pulse rifle at the alien he then shoots it in the face and says get away from here you bitch he even hesitates as he says you bitch now for me he he might as well have just looked at the camera and winked because that's just too far that is ridiculous that is an in joke I'd expect that in Deadpool and Wolverine, but this is supposed to be an alien movie. This is a horror movie that's that's played straight, and not some kind of self-referential comedy. This is supposed to be a horror movie, and that was an eye roller. That was a real, real low point in the movie. Just that one little line was ridiculous. I don't know how that's made it into the final cut of the movie. It was ridiculous. It was. It felt like an outtake. There's no reason for him to say it. There was no the context of the scene was was not there. He'd already killed the alien. And he just says that just as a as a reference to aliens, just as a reminder to the audience, oh have you watched aliens? And you know, obviously we have. So those little things, that's what bring the movie down for me. The design was perfect. I thought the cinematography was perfect. I thought the, the, the tone of the movie and the pacing was excellent. The performances, for the most part, I thought were really strong. It was just the, the references and the callbacks. 
it really, really let the movie down for me. Um, still very, very enjoyable. You know, a great movie, great looking movie. I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I can understand why people are very, very angry. It's understandable because these little things, they hit people harder than others. I can kind of let it slide and just get on with it and think, yeah, that's fine. I can see why people are disappointed because they've probably gone into the movie thinking this is going to be its own thing, it's going to be a standalone story, respect the previous movies but do something different, but I suppose it relied just too heavily on the previous movies. I'm constantly trying to remind people of the of the franchise, much like um, Ghostbusters, um, Afterlife and Frozen Empire, they are both completely weighed down by their obsession with reminding the audience about the original movie and it's completely unnecessary so I suppose it's about balance you you probably you need nods to previous movies so it's so it's relevant so it feels like it's in that world so it feels like it ties in but there is a level, there is a limit to to what you can do. And this movie, I wouldn't say it went beyond the limits of that, but I think it, it pushed them to to, to breaking point. Um, and I suppose, I mean, what do you do? What, I mean, how much is too much? I mean, to fix this movie, I mean, what could what could they have done? to improve the movie to, to sort of please everybody and I'd probably say take out the mad android take away Rook, take away the CGI Ian Holm, take that out completely the module that goes into Andy's neck, that can give the exposition of what's happened on the station that can be the, the evil robot side of it, this duality going on inside Andy between his programming and then take out the black goo as well. So when Kay gets into a sleep pod, maybe give some kind of hint that she might have been impregnated by a face over after all. And as they're going into cryo sleep, maybe her bio signatures start to spike or something like that. You know, we keep the keep the audience guessing. And then they just fly off into the into the sunset. Would that have made it a, a, a tighter movie? Would it have made it stronger? Because it was on quite a long time. It is a long movie. I think it could have... It started to lag near the end. I was very much aware that it was... When it was coming up to the the end of the third act, I felt like it, it could have just ended there. I don't think it needed the scene with the hybrid. It felt like it had ended and then it ended again sort of spoilt it for me a little bit i think it would have i just think it would have been much more of a tighter and more compact horror film if you take out those those layers but i mean i'm not a filmmaker i just pay money to watch these movies i'm not the expert but uh, i mean let me know what you think let me know in the comments like and subscribe i'll see you again signing off